What is down everybody? It's your main course of Pancake. Welcome back to another video. Today we will be talking about the Potu. A bird. Uh, a very peculiar looking bird that I think is quite interesting. It's got some interesting factoids about it and uh, I'm looking forward to learning about it with you guys. Smash like, subscribe, and let's learn about this old government spy also known as birds. The Putu scientific family name is Nictibidae. Uh, there are seven species within this family, two genuses. The Putu is a family of bird, pretty much. Uh, split into two genuses, seven species. One genus only has one species. The other genus has six. We'll get into that a little bit later. Let's start off by where, where to look. Where, if I want to find a Potu, where am I going to look? You're going to want to go south of North America. That entails Central America and South America. Um, they are scattered all throughout South America, all throughout Central America, and there are even some on a few Caribbean islands, like uh, Jamaica has Potu birds. That's cool. But you want to hear something really cool? There used to be Potu birds in Europe. There was a full fossil of a potu bird found in Germany. It's estimated that they went extinct about 23 to 66 million years ago in the European area, but uh, they used to be there. So it's a, a very peculiar situation of did they start in Europe, go to South America, flourish in South America and die off in Europe? Did they go to Europe from South America, start really well and then die off soon after they blew up in Europe? Uh, nobody really knows. It's a really peculiar thing that I think is pretty cool. Now when you go to South America or Central America or Jamaica, wherever you're going on your hunt for the Potu, you got to know what to look for. The appearance does vary with each species. As I said, there's seven species. They don't all look the exact same. They share a lot of similar characteristics, but the majority of these appearance facts are fairly general. There's, there's margin for error on, on both sides of the spectrum here. They are typically eight to 23 inches in length. There are some bigger species, some smaller species. Everybody else is in between, you know what I mean? But not big, they're not they're not big birds. They're not like eagles or osprey or anything like that. Very proportionally large wings and tails. Uh, when you look at the, the size of their actual body, the wings and the tail is longer and larger than you would suspect. And they have extremely large eyes when compared to their body size. The eye to body ratio is not normal. It is per se abnormal. We don't judge here on this channel, you know? He's beautiful. The Potu is beautiful just the way they are. No matter how creepy you may think they look, don't say anything, because Potu have feelings just like we do. So, very large eyes. Better to see you with, my pretty. Their beaks look very small, you know? Like, like look at this, that's his beak. It looks pretty small, looks pretty short, doesn't look like it do much damage, but they can open them. They can really open them. Like, look at that, yeah. They can open them They're like an anaconda. They can like unhinge their jaw almost. It's, it's quite wild looking. Another fact about their beaks on the upper part of their beak. So their upper, their upper jaw, I guess not really a jaw, but they have a little tooth that comes out a little snaggle tooth helps with, uh, you know, cutting stuff and breaking stuff and whatnot. They have very weak legs. They don't, uh, walk very much at all. They stand quite a bit. They perch, but there is not much walking entailed in the Potu life. Now, something very, very interesting that I found out that I learned in my extensive research. So Potu are nocturnal. So during the day, they they just hang around. They camouflage themselves. They have very, very good camouflage. They camouflage themselves as trees. I mean, look at this. Where's the bird? I don't know. Can you find it? But during the day, they just they sit, and that's pretty much it. A lot of times they'll close their eyes, whatnot. Now, their eyes have special slits on their lid, the lids of their eyes, that allow them to see movement when their eyes are closed. So like, if I was a potu right now, I'm perched on top of a, a stump, just sitting there, blending in, and I see a, 
a jaguar walk in front of me. I can see, even with my eyes closed, I can see that there is movement in front of me. That's pretty wild. That's really cool. As I was saying about their camouflage, that is their main defense tactic. They just sit there. They stay perfectly still. They don't move. They freeze. Whoa. But if this doesn't work and they uh, they can't fly away, so an instance of this would be if they were on a nest or something like that, and a predator is kind of looking at them a little shifty, a little shady. They're like, hey, 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 dinner. So if camouflage doesn't work and if they can't fly away, what they do is they go for the intimidation tactic, which I can respect. What they do is they open their eyes as wide as they can get them, which is like this big, and um, open their beaks all the way up and screech. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was looking for a meal and that was an option, was a screeching potu with his eyes and beak all the way open, I think I would opt to eat something else, me personally. I can't speak for you, you know, but uh, no thanks. Let's move on to the Putu diet and hunting. As I mentioned previously, they are nocturnal, meaning that they mostly function at night in the dark, dusk, dawn, and night. They are insectivores, meaning that they pretty much only eat insects. Their main, their favorite insect, I guess you could say, it are beetles. They eat a lot of beetles. That's their main go-to. Kind of like Dr. Pepper for me. Basically, the way that they hunt is they stay perched on their branch, just like they are in the day. Every now and then, they, they swoop out, make a little loop-de-loop -loop or what whatnot, get them a beetle or a grasshopper or a other insect. I, I don't know butterfly maybe they grab it and they swallow it whole they do not chew at all they just don't it's kind of like me if i get some hot krispy kreme donuts there is no chewing it's just swallowing whole inhaling engulfing i actually just got a notification that says that that the uh the hot sign is on so that's their uh their main food collecting stuff uh, reproduction. Let's get into the hanky-panky of the situation. Something really interesting I found, which is actually uh, a lot of bird species do this. Putu, potu are monogamous, meaning that they mate with one one other potu for life. I think it's uh, just an interesting f nat natural thing. One second. Hello? Matt. So anyway, back to birds having sex. Like I said, they're monogamous. Both parents are like kind of equal partners in raising the chick, which is uh, also something that I find very interesting. Um, I know like like penguins are this way, but a lot of animals don't like either the the female or the male are the main caretaker of the offspring. But in this scenario, both parents help in the raising of the chick. They also only lay one egg at a time, which I thought was interesting for a bird of that size. Um, I mean, you think of like any kind of tweety bird, like robins or finches and stuff like that. They usually lay, at least I think, a, a few eggs at a time, you know, three, four, something like that. But they only lay one egg at a time. Remember how I said that they always, they like to perch on top of stumps or on branches? So they lay the singular egg. They don't make a nest for it or anything. They either lay it inside of a stump that they can just perch on or in like a like a divot in a branch that they can perch on. So so that they can stay camouflaged while being on the egg, which uh, is pretty smart. Uh, the eggs are white with a purple brownish spots on it speckled throughout, which is pretty cool. Another interesting thing is during... During the day, the males incubate the egg, which means that the males sit on the egg, keep it warm. And then once nighttime rolls around, they alternate with the female. So one of them goes out, gets some bugs, comes back, sits on the egg. The other one goes out, gets some bugs. It's pretty cool. The chick hatches after just one month, 
of being in egg form, which is kind of fast, but not, I mean, I'd say that's probably about normal, I guess. Um, and then something that I think is, whoa, is so the, um, the chicks are white. Like when they're, when they're born, their feathers and fur almost is white so that they resemble fungus on the logs which is awesome so like you got the the stump and then the actual the adult potu looking like an extension of the stump and then you got the little little chick sitting there blending in with the stump which is awesome now let's talk a little bit about the evolution and history of the potu as a species as I mentioned, there are seven species in the Potu family. I'm gonna just go ahead and name off these species. I'm gonna butcher these names. Fosho Fosho. Phileemolor bracteatus. The one one genus is Phileemolor. Phileelum. Phileem. Phileemolor is that one. Its common name is the Rufus Potu. It is the smallest bullfella. Um, and then we've got Nictibius grandis, common name Great Potu, which is the largest. Nictibius aetherius, Aether, uh, the common name of that one is the long-tailed Potu. Then we've got Nictibius jamaicensis, also known as the northern Potu. Nictibius grisius, known as the common Potu. Nictibius maculos, maculosus, the Andean Potu and Nictibius leocopteris, the white-winged potu. Those are the seven species. Remember I said there's two genuses in the, the potu family, Phylia malor and Nictibius. One Phylia malor species, six Nictibius species. When uh, the mitochondrial DNA of potu uh, was analyzed, it showed that there was a extreme amount of genetic divergence between the seven species which means basically that the the potu family the nictibidae family is very old and has been around for a very long time and that's how you get so much divergence is say it takes 10 million years for a species to diverge into two well 10 million years later they're going to be more genetically di divergent. And you keep going down, you get more and more diverse between the species. More genetic differences. It is actually the highest level of the divergence of any genus of bird. And that's referring to the Nictibius genus, not the Phileomolor. Another thing that this kind of means is that more specific species may continue to be distinguished. So 10 years from now, instead of seven species of potu, there might be 10 or 12. So if you've got two, they'll diverge into four and, all right, let me restart. You got one species, it'll diverge into two. These two, one of them might diverge into two more, and now you've got three. So you take this extremely long amount of time that the potu have been around, it'll create a lot of species and subspecies. So. I look, I, I would, just from my scientific common sense mixture brain, I would say that more POTU species will be distinguished over the next few years probably. And an example of this is just recently the northern POTU and the common POTU were separated into two different species. And this was due to the differences in their mating calls was found and distinguished. That's the potus. Now let's get into some fun facts. Yeah, this is the part that everybody stays around for. And so the potu, potu has uh, some like native names. A uh, pretty common kind of nickname for it is the poor me ones. Um, I don't know why, but it's due to their call, which uh, we'll listen to here in a minute. We'll, we'll kind of end the video listening to some of their calls in brazil they are called urutau which means ghost bird which is cool that's that's cool all right ghost bird 
it is nifty. Now, as I mentioned, their their calls are described as haunting. Um, part of this reason is because they call at night. They're nocturnal, so they're not going to be making much noise during the day. But when it's dark out, they'll be screeching. You know what I mean? This eerie noises have actually led to a couple of myths. There's a story in the Amazon area of South America, kind of like a like a folklore a myth, that uh, two children were abandoned in the forest by their parents, and uh, they turned into birds eventually after being in the forest for so long, and that the sound of the potu is them eternally yelling mama, calling for their mother that abandoned them. So... And then it's kind of a similar story in Ecuador. There's a myth that two lovers were separated. One became the moon and the other became the Epotu. If you ask me, the Potu kind of got the short end of the stick. I mean, being a moon, being a celestial body, and then being a an eight-inch bird. I mean, you know, to each their own. And the myth is that the Potu is eternally calling out to their lover, which they can never reach because it's it's the moon, you know. Um, so now we're going to, there's a really cool website. It's called Zeno Canto, sharing wildlife sounds from around the world. So I'll put it in the description if you want to look up some some different birds or I, I'm guessing they have all kinds of animals here honestly so we're gonna listen to a couple a couple different potu sounds so this first one is the andean potu so this one lives of course in the andy mountains so there's that that's the andean potu uh pretty cool we'll listen to the common potu next Dang. All right, I can see how that would be a little concerning if you were just walking around the woods at night and you heard that. Mm-hmm. So it's really cool, though. I mean, it's a cool sound. Let's go for the Great Potu, the, the biggest one. It's a more gravelly. That sounds cool. Yeah, no, I, I, I understand the uh, fear surrounding that noise. <laughs> Let's listen to one more. Let's choose one more. The white-winged potu. That was something right there. Holy crap. It's a very high pitch. Very different from the, the great potu. So very high pitch, kind of a screech. Whereas the great potu is more of a gravelly sound. Interesting. That's cool. There's a cool website here. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the potu. Now you know all you need to know about the potu. Tell your friends. Tell your family. Tell your loved ones. Tell everybody about the potu. Um, and me. All the sources that I found this information from will be in the description. Uh, that website we just listened to and a couple others that I got my information from. Uh, if you want to double check me, you can go for it. That's pretty much all I got for you today, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to smash like and subscribe if you did. And uh, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Make someone else's day better if you can. And I will see all of y'all later.